Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It is the 8th of November, 2012, and we have special guests here, Veronica Boixmancia and Tony Jackson. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. I do okay, Veronica? Hello? Yes? Did I do okay with your name? Yes. Oh, you did beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, and it, oh, and, and it was a tall order. Well, a guy with a last name Hargadon has to do some things right. The Future of Education is sponsored by my Web 2.0 Labs project, uh, web20labs.com. Thanks to Mighty Bell and Blackboard Collaborate for support. I'm on my Hack Your Education tour, which is a lot of fun. I'm actually sitting outside of Panera Bread. Uh, on my way to Philadelphia for a fun set of sessions tomorrow. Can't wait for those who are going to be there. Coming up next week, our massive global education conference. This is so much fun. Five days, 24 hours a day. We sure hope that you will consider attending to globaleducationconference.com. It is free. And uh, over 400 sessions, terrific keynotes. This interview tonight is kind of a prelude to that, so we're going to touch on some topics and themes here which are very important. If you missed the Learning 2.0 conference or the Library 2.012 conference, those recordings are all up online and free as well. Coming up on the Future of Education, next week is the Global Education Conference on November 20th. Karen Beersethi, or Sethi on Teaching Kids to Take Charge. Can't wait for that. Charles Hayes on Self University after that. Jim Groom on the Demand of One's Own. Ray McNulty on Schools. Cal Newport comes back to talk about uh, why skills trump passion. Can't wait to. He's always challenging, Cal is. Then, tonight, announcing for the first time, we have some really fun events coming up. The School Leadership Summit, co sponsored by TCAL, will take place on March 28th, the virtual conference. Then, on April 23rd to 25th, Intel is, or sorry, Intel. I'm going to get shot for that. Hewlett Packard is helping to sponsor a STEM, a worldwide STEM conference. Then, on May 3rd through 5th, the uh, RSCon and uh, Reform Symposium, and then on May 16th, a Worldwide Homeschool Conference. So much fun coming up. If you've missed any of the shows, they are all recorded in full Blackboard Collaborate form in an MP3. Yale Wishnick talked to us last week about uh, a culture of dependency. And a fascinating discussion with someone who's worked heavily in California schools and looking at uh, the uh, larger ramifications of the school system. Jamie McMillan talked about legendary learners, Denise Pope from Stanford, on all kinds of things, including success. Anyway, lots up there. Hopefully something of interest to you that makes it worth listening to. So this is your chance to let us know where you're participating from. Look to the left of the map for the star icon. Click on the star and click on it again and then click on the map. Feel free to shout out in the chat as well. Like I said, uh, I just drove past long gas lines in New York, which was no surprise, but I had forgotten that that was still going on. Tony, so we can hear a little background noise from your mic. I think I'm going to recommend that you turn your microphone off when you're not talking, and then yeah, turn it back on when you are. Yep, just go ahead and perfect. So wherever you're participating from, we're sure glad to have you here. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks again to Tony and Veronica for being a part of this. There is a Mighty Bell for this session. Mighty Bell is the new project from Gina Bianchini. It's a curation and conversation piece. I'm going to put the address in the chat. I put some links to uh, Tony and Veronica's material in that Mighty Bell, and you can continue the conversation there. Okay, so this is really fun. I did load your slides, Veronica. Honor sent some slides. Your slides actually were pretty much identical, except you had more material. So you have those slides at your disposal if you would like them. 
Um, I'd love for the two of you to each introduce yourself, though, briefly, and kind of tell the story of how you came together on this publication. And, and Veronica, can I start with you? Yes, absolutely. So, um, so I uh, I'm a, a researcher at uh, Project Zero at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and for uh, many years I've been doing a work on um, how young people come to think. Uh, in disciplinary terms, in terms of history and biology and, and the arts, and in interdisciplinary terms, and how, how, how they come to understand complex problems through interdisciplinary lenses. And it was through a project that dealt with um, students' understanding of globalization and teachers' understanding of the phenomenon of globalization that I um, that I that I thought um, about a phenomenon that I was observing among all of us, uh, the teachers and the researchers and the students uh, in that particular research project, that I came to call global consciousness. We were enhancing our awareness of the world around us and enhancing a sense of belonging, if you wish, to a world that was much, much larger as we became aware of the phenomenon of globalization, a world that was much, much larger than, uh, than the world with which we began this project. I wrote that paper uh, in collaboration with Howard Gardner, um, my colleague at Project Zero, uh, and uh, and I hear uh, Tony that you that you um, that you got a hold of that of, of that paper, and I was very um, and I was very pleased to be invited by Tony uh, uh, for what turned out to be a grand breaking initiative uh, by the Asia Society. I had always been an admirer of the Asia Society. Um, so a groundbreaking initiative that uh, Tony led with the CCSSO um, uh, to define global competence uh, for um, education in America and beyond uh, today. So Tony, let's have you uh, do the same if you would. Sure. And I'm always kind of hearing Veronica, so if I'm repeating the thing, um, when, when our stories come together, I'm sorry. Um, basically, um, it was about 12 years ago that I, uh, the Asian Society, um, took a good hard look at um, what students in schools knew about Asia and about the world and what teachers were, te were, te were teaching about Asia and the world and found in both instances um, it was uh, rather little in both cases. So that launched a, a really a, a decade-long effort to um, think about ways in which uh, Asian Society and other organizations could be instrumental in developing um, what we later came to call greater global competence among, among youth, among um, uh, students in, in American schools and, 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 and in schools around the world, frankly. Um, and so I came on board at Asian Society in 2003 because we felt as though in addition to work in kind of the advocacy community to uh, or have global competence be a greater priority for American education, there needed to be actual proof points on the ground of what an education that really blended uh, a global focus with um, a college preparatory curriculum could look like and how you could actually bring together um, global knowledge and awareness with um, uh, learning within the discipline. So we started the International Study Schools Network of Schools that are really small, globally focused, uh, initially secondary schools, but now uh, high, uh, middle schools and, and elementary schools as well. That, that take this idea forward and from everything from the culture to the curriculum instruction assessment to the way in which the school relates to the community tries to you know actualize this notion of a globally focused education. Um, and in that context, we realized we really needed to be very clear and definitive about what we meant by global competence. And so that led to an opportunity to work with the Council of TK School Officers as part of their EdSteps project to form a task force, of which Veronica was a distinguished member, um, and think deeply together um, and look at other uh, resources from around the world as to what we really meant by global competence. And that eventually resulted in the book that's um, featured on the screen now that uh, Veronica and I had the pleasure of working together to, to create. Um, so that's, that's how we have come to work, to work together and how we've advanced this notion within our book. Thanks, Tony. And that is how we continue to work together in Munich. Yes, how nice. So, Veronica, I spent a year when I was in high school living in Brazil. I was part of an exchange program, uh, the AFS program. Do you think that that mm -hmm. gave me a specific set of skills or understanding that are unique? And is the idea of global competence related to the kind of understanding that I would have gotten in that experience? 
I think that that's a I think that that's a good question because because it raises the question to you as to what exactly it was that you did in Brazil when you were there uh, for a year. Um, how alert were you? Were you, for example, in an American school in Brazil um, with um, uh, with the expat community and not interacting much, much with the local, you know, with with, with local Brazilians, or were you uh, immersed to trying to understand and focused on trying to make sense of this um, of this uh, new reality in which you lived? So, for example, did you have a chance to learn a little bit of Portuguese? Um, did you have a chance to understand the phenomenon of to the bang, for instance, which is an expression that that is literally translated as uh, it's all right or all is right. Um, but yet it has a very, very deep cultural meaning. It just connects people immediately, as people say, to the bang, to the bang, to each other. Um, so what happened during that year and how sort of the, the experience that you had, the level of connection with Brazilian history, Brazilian culture, Brazilian people, Brazilian friends, um, will determine the degree to which um, you uh, left that experience uh, with a more complex uh, and richer uh, intellectual and emotional understanding of this uh, environment, this uh, cultural context, um, or not. So I love how you described that. I would say one of the biggest and most significant um, parts of my experience in Brazil, and yes, I did learn Portuguese, and yes, I did study in a Brazilian school, and I lived, it was an immersion program, I lived with a Brazilian family, was my ability to see the world outside of the context in which I had grown up. And I often will use the word meta to, to relate to that, sort of a meta level mm -hmm. of understanding. Um, but Tony, that's clearly just only a part of the framework sort of, of understanding the world and the dimensions of global competence. So can we use that as kind of a springboard, Tony, to talk about what those four elements are? Sure. I'll make sure my microphone's on. Yeah. Um, well, let me preface it by saying, though, that uh, one of the things we want to really think is important to kind of realize is that um, the four kind of pillars of global competence that I'll describe in just a second, um, they, they rest on an ability for students to Sort of develop their understanding of the world and, and develop their capacities in these ways through, through deep disciplinary and interdisciplinary study. You don't develop global competence outside of the, the curriculum, as it were. It really is an investigation of the curriculum and using it as a, as a platform to develop one's global competence. So, so young people need to, to, you know, to understand from a historical perspective to think like historians or to think like scientists, but they need to think in those ways um, from a global perspective. So it's kind of important to to note that there's a kind of an undergirding assumption in our notion of global competence that it's derived from, from deep discipline and interdisciplinary study. But the, 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 the core tenets, um, uh, really, first of all, it, it's this notion of being able to investigate the world. And by that we mean that students are able to, first of all, frame important questions from a global perspective and then to be able to use um, a wide variety of of resources from international resources that they're able to um, access through digital technology to put those resources and ideas together in a compelling evidence-based argument and then to be able to create a persuasive um, presentation of ideas that takes into consideration multiple perspectives and, 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 and uses that knowledge to really kind of advance an understanding of the phenomenon. Um, so that's, that's the whole notion of investigating the world as a core element of it. Then there is the, the notion of recognizing perspectives. And when you were speaking about your experience in Brazil, that came to mind that, that what you were doing, what you were developing there, was an ability to kind of, first of all, understand that you yourself have a perspective that others may not share, um, but that then there is um, a, an opportunity to look at the world from other, 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 other viewpoints. And what I think is important here is that it's, it's not just a matter of sort of um, observing that there are other viewpoints, but rather bringing those viewpoints into your own consciousness and, and sort of reshaping your own world view through the interaction of your, your perspective with others. Um, then there is the idea of communicating ideas. Um, and here we're talking about the phenomenon where young people begin to develop an understanding that, that uh, um, audiences differ in their, in their perception of sometimes the very same information. And, and by virtue of culture or, or, or ideology or religion or background or um, many, many factors, um, 
uh, there are differences um, that one, one needs to take into consideration as to how both to communicate with and how to uh, understand um, and, and look at the perspective of others um, in order to be able to communicate uh, effectively. And, and in my view, that also kind of bleeds over into the notion of being able to collaborate with people and to work in, in cross-cultural teams and to, to be able to bring ideas across uh, cultural bounds is, is an important part of being able to communicate ideas. And then a very important um, aspect uh, of our, of our um, concept of global competence is the notion of taking action. Um, and that is really, here we're talking about the kind of not only learning about the world, but making a difference in the world and, and, and applying one's knowledge to, again, frame important questions, but then actually to pursue those questions either individually or, uh, or collaboratively so that you actually um, consider consequences but then move forward in, in, in advocating and, and, and trying to make a difference uh, in the world for, for the common good, as it were, based on your knowledge. So. Those, those are really the four key tenets of, of what we think of as global competence. So, Veronica, I'm really interested by this because my experience in Brazil is maybe a good way for me to frame the next question. It wasn't nearly as neat and organized as this. And for me as an individual, there's a little bit of messiness involved in coming to that perspective and learning to investigate the world and communicating ideas. Is there a danger when you put it in this kind of a framework that it becomes a little bit of a grocery list for educators? And how do you move past kind of a checklist into really, I mean, these are really important times and really important global issues. How do you help make sure that this is actually kind of real? Gosh, I am so pleased that you brought this up because in a way, part of the challenges that we, part of the challenge that we face in education and education reform today is the problem of sort of the grammar of schooling, sort of this, this tradition that we have created in schools by which everything becomes a bullet point and everything becomes um, a bit of information that needs to be mastered. Um, it becomes a grid, it becomes a checklist. So I am really pleased about the fact that you bring this up um, because while we have to we have tried to um, organize some of these ideas in 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 a way that uh, anal analytically um, holds together the in no way are these uh, silo enterprises so as you're investigating the world for example as you're trying to figure out for example the origins of carnival in Brazil because you find yourself you know having to prepare for the February this February event and you want to find out a little bit about what it means so all of a sudden you find yourself not only reading, reading a little bit about it because you're curious about it, but at the same time you're chatting with your friends who are preparing the, the outfits and you come to understand that this means an enormous amount, that there's an enormous amount of tradition, that families gather together, that young people are free and um, and and participate in carnival, that carnival is an incredibly public uh, public event. And there's no way in which the world organizes itself around this <laughs> around this um, this uh, this chart. Uh, what we can do is uh, use the chart as a lens to try to pay attention to particular aspects of what otherwise feels like a very complex uh, experience, and this is one of the reasons why we have tried in that in the book um, that, that that Tony and I uh, wrote, we have tried to highlight the importance of good examples, sort of good cases, good practices in which sort of in the messiness of practice, in the messiness of of trying to understand how fax machines travel around the world, as uh, as one of our cases uh, suggests from Reggio Emilia. Um, we can uh, use that frame uh, of the quadrants that Tony was describing in order to see what matters, what should I pay attention to, how can I give a little bit of order to this uh, uh, naturally messy back and forth practice of, of, of understanding a complex a complex uh, topic uh, or making sense of a complex uh, experience so that I can be a little bit more deliberate uh, about where to focus my attention uh, as a as an educator or as a learner uh, myself. So I could do two things at this point, and you let me know what you think might make more sense. One is I could uh, unpack this example of sort of 
early um, childhood uh, Reggio Emilia exploration of fax machines. Um, uh, or we can, uh, or we could, um, or we could go back to your case of uh, of Brazil to try to see uh, particular um, experiences that you may have had in Brazil as you were growing up, um, and then we could apply that framework to try to distill aspects of your uh, of your experience. What would you like? So I'd love to have. Uh I'd love to, to go through a couple of these examples that you have. Uh, would this be a good one for you, Veronica? And then uh, maybe, Tony, you could think of is one of the other ones uh, that's in the slide deck maybe good for you to speak on? And I'll let the two of you kind of figure that out. But yes, I would love to see, to, I think our audience would love to hear some examples here. And this might be a good one to start with. Okay. Okay, and I can start with this one, um, uh, and I'm sure that Tony has a sort of a collection of uh, of, uh, of examples to uh, to choose from, uh, whether there are sort of in our in our slides uh, or not. So here's so so the image that you see in front of you is uh, a construction of children uh, of ages of five, around five, in Reggio Emilia, which is a a, a very very Powerful early childhood learning center uh, in Reggio in Italy. Um, of course, now the method of Reggio Emilia is being applied sort of across across the ages. But what these kids are trying to figure out and they're depicting in this uh, in this image uh, is how it is that they could send a fax. How did you say they could send a message to a friend that had moved from Reggio in Italy to uh, the United States uh, and Washington, D.C.? How they could uh, send a fax or a message as fast as possible? One of the children comes up with this idea that a fax machine um, exists and it sends messages instantly. And they are charged with trying to figure out how it is that faxes fly around the world. So um, the the teachers do not explain uh, a fax machine. They do not request uh, definitions of a fax machine. They do not provide too much initial information about a fax machine. And the kids construct their own um, intuitive theories about uh, how the world works, uh, what's the territory that these that this fax needs to cover. So it needs to go across an ocean. And, and at some point, one of the kids mentions the fact that it probably needs to pass through Ireland and he saw that there were mountains in Ireland, so he needed to draw some mountains for Ireland. And the ocean has birds and boats, and the ocean is really very big, and there's life under the ocean. And maybe this fax machine is carried by birds, the fax, the paper, is carried by birds, or it goes under a tunnel under the ocean. So they're trying to figure out you know, how this message uh, goes across, uh, travels across uh, the world. And they're bringing together all of their uh, prior experience, which is not too extensive as they are only five, um, to, to try to depict uh, the planet and what they know uh, about the planet. Uh, what you see there is children engaged in, uh, so of course they look, into, they look at globes, they begin to sort of form this notion of the round planet and distances and continents and, and so forth. So what you see is very young children, which debunks the notion that global competence is only for older kids. Um, so very, very young children trying to make sense of the complexities of uh, geography, uh, if you wish, um, locating um, locating uh, continents, uh, locating uh, landscapes, um, and around a topic that is of enormous interest to them because they truly want to send this message to a friend who just moved to Washington, D.C. As they find uh, images of Washington, D.C., they then wonder about uh, whether all cities are alike, are all cities like Reggio Emilia. Uh, do, does Washington D.C. have the same kinds of pets? Do kids go to school in the same way? Do the schools look the same? Uh, so here you see children very naturally beginning to take perspective, trying to understand whether their experience in their own city is similar or different uh, from that of their friend who has just uh, moved. So, um, so in a sense, you you find very young children engaging in what we might call um, uh, investigating the world um, in very meaningful, not rote or routine ways, and um, what we might call 
uh, taking perspective, uh, trying to understand the experience of others and understand, therefore, their own experience at Red Year. Uh, in communicating uh, ideas visually and verbally um, in powerful uh, ways. Uh, and eventually, they will send a fax to their friend, uh, which would be sort of the beginnings of taking action. Now, clearly, do these kids know that there's a the four quadrants associated to what they're doing? Oh, they don't know that. But um, uh, but what they have is a very, very rich experience, which has all of the nuances and complexities of deep learning. Um, and we, as educators, can uh, distill, hopefully without breaking away the nuance and the richness of this experience, we can distill uh, principles that, uh, that might be sort of underlying um, some of these uh, learning experiences for kids. That's terrific. Tony, we didn't mean to put you on the spot, but is there an example that you feel like you would be, uh, you would like to talk about? I think there was one that um, I'll mention that um, uh, I don't know if we have a small part to say, but I have to use some different ideas. And um, one of the books that uh, it actually draws, uh, it's sure gotten really bad for microphone. some reason. Sorry? Yeah, we're having a hard time hearing you. Uh, um, just make sure your microphone's positioned close to your mouth, and let's try again. It is. Yeah, can you hear me now? Hello? Yes, terrific. Yeah. Okay, all right. So um, it's not one, I'll, I'll be quick, it, it's not one that um, is uh, one slide for, but uh, it is, it's one that we use in the book to um, uh, talk about uh, the, the power of communication and, and communicating ideas. And um, it is drawn from an, an, an international school in Amsterdam, a high school project. And you see a happening that uh, the, the students were asked to create. And it had to do with the title of the happening, which is um, uh, event, I do a performance artist, you know, um, was called Put Your Culture in a Box and Follow Me. And the, the point really was to um, create an experience where people would begin to understand the experience of, being, of, of colonialization and what that meant. Um, and what students did essentially is they, they had um, the teachers and the other people who were invited to this event. They could have engaged I'm so them. sorry to interrupt again. I really apologize, but your audio is going in and out, and this is strange given that it was so clear just a moment ago. Is there any chance that your microphone has moved? Um, well, it, it is as close as I can get it. Is that any better? I don't know what to do. Uh, now um, we're hearing you quite clearly. Okay, well, I'll, I'll try to stay in that exact position. <laughs> um, so anyway, I, I was saying that. Um, Thank you. It, 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 can, can you hear me? I, I was saying that. Uh, yes. Uh, the, the effort here was to sort of communicate to an audience what it like, what, what it's like to be uh, colonized, to be to be um, oppressed in, in, in a colonial situation. And so the students actually um, communicated not only verbally, but by actually having uh, the audience become part of the of the experience. And they, um, they they sort of communicated the idea of losing one's identity by having um, the audience uh, uh, deposit their valuables and, and aspects of their identity in a kind of museum space. And the notion here was to create the understanding that you know an identity can identity can be taken away from you. Um, and they then spoke to the uh, audience in four or five different languages all at once, very loudly and very harsh commands um, to show that communication can be used not only to communicate but also to create an understanding of one's position um, and to uh, uh, sort of actualize the hegemony that one has over another. Um, and they also um, Used uh, kind of a multimedia approach to it. They they themselves dressed in in black and they had masks on that they indicated even as they were doing it that they, they sort of took away their own identity. One of the students says that we chose masks to symbolize the difference in cultures and and what, once we put those masks on, we really weren't ourselves anymore. So they they um, they were able to sort of use a, a variety of artistic expressions and, and modes of expression to communicate um, again. Uh, uh, a sensitivity to how one's how if one is perceived can support um, the way in which one is, is, is able to see dominance over another, um, and so 
it, it really was a very, um, and I'm probably not doing justice in the way I've described it, but it, it was a very telling way in which communication, they showed their understanding of, of how communication can, can uh, you know, be used to affect a social position. Um, and, and it really was quite a, 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 a I think, a, a, a telling and, and stirring example of, of how communication and a knowledge of communication and its, and its power can be really used to, um, uh, it, it shows their competence in, in that understanding of communication, I would say. I'll leave it at that. Well, I really want to come back and ask you about the schools, but before we do so, I want to ask Veronica another question. And Veronica, I loved your answer about the grammar of teaching. Um, the, sort of the second issue for me would be this question of uh, what kind of in-service or pre-service or experiences are valuable to teachers that they have to know how to do this kind of work in their classroom. How much do they have to have their own global experiences in order to understand how to bring these kinds of projects into the classroom? Hmm. Um, gosh, you are a good interviewer because you have incredibly good questions, Steve. The, um, so the um, I, I think that that's, I think that that's a, that's that's a fabulous question, and and I think that the the short answer is that empirically speaking, in terms of systematic studies of teacher global competence, we know really very little. Uh, in terms of research. However, there's um, an enormous uh, amount of sort of practical experience by very sort of illuminated educators um, from which we can uh, from from which uh, we can learn. I think that we need to begin with the idea that uh, education for global competence is actually not just for teachers, not just for students, but for teachers and for the public at large. One of the differences between educating and century ago and educating today is that a century ago we probably had a sense of the direction in which the world was going. Um, and we uh, were charged with educating younger people in order to um, adapt and participate in a world that was a little bit more predictable for us than uh, the world in which we live today. Today, um, we need to educate the public for a world that is changing. So everybody needs to learn to adapt. Um, so it, when we think about educating for global competence, we certainly think about kids um, and youth. Uh, but as you well suggest, uh, we need to be thinking about uh, teachers um, as well in a very, very, uh, in a very, very serious way. Um, there are a few um, practices, if you wish, that um, that that we have seen or that we're beginning to see that uh, that have been incredibly helpful. That we have seen as being incredibly helpful. Of course, you know, there's the uh, the, the the teachers who have experiences like yours in Brazil, um, who can travel, sort of the Fulbright um, you know, Fulbright teachers, for example, um, who. Uh, who not only visit uh, other uh, countries, but they 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 collaborate, they study uh, in the best case scenarios. They develop curriculum as they are visiting um, other countries. Uh, so that's that's certainly um, something that is um, that is that is very productive. Um, at the same time, um, we live in a world in which you don't need to go too far away in order to encounter the world, so to speak. Um, I can um, I can drive um, down the street from Cambridge, Massachusetts, to the Chinese uh, neighborhood in Boston, and I will learn enormous amounts. Or the Brazilian neighborhood in uh, uh, in Austin, and I'll, I'll learn enormous amounts about um, about uh, not only about Brazilian or Chinese uh, cultures but also about the adaptation uh, of, um, of communities who migrate. So we don't need to send teachers to uh, Africa or Sweden in order to, uh, in order to prepare them. Uh, we simply need to open their minds and their curiosity to visit uh, the neighborhoods uh, around us, uh, so to speak. Um, so that's one sort of more experientially uh, based um, uh, approach. Uh, but another approach has a lot to do with um, with uh, looking very, very carefully uh, at um, at practice and and finding um, and finding those um, places in their own practice that uh, merit deep reflection. Um, and merit uh, uh, focused uh, innovation. So for example, um, we're now working with the Portland Public Schools uh, in uh, Maine. 
and we are um, working with a collection of uh, of teachers across uh, across the district. One of the things that teachers are organized in learning communities, so very much like you would expect in sort of professional learning communities um, across the country. But what's unique about these professional learning communities is that the teachers are documenting the practice. So every conversation is about a particular moment of practice or a particular case of student work that speaks to the issue of global competence. And those documentation, serious documentation, videographic uh, notes, uh, reflections, uh, that is put at the center of the conversation in order to, for teachers to, um, uh, to um, explore where their students and where they themselves are advancing global competence or could advance global competence. So there's something to be said about uh, very carefully designed teacher collaboration practices uh, in terms of uh, in-service and pre-service um, instruction. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop right there because I know that, uh, that Tony also has sort of enormous experience in this, in this regard. Um, if I could just maybe add one quick thing. Yeah, a lot of the and how am I doing in terms of sound? You know what I'm saying? I will think so. You're coming um, in a little loud, except that when you keep talking, go ahead. I'll, it I'll seems to get my, better as you keep talking. Um, I just wanted to mention that at Asia Society, we've actually put a lot of work into trying to develop um, professional development for teachers that actually allows them to, um, in effect, teach for global competence, as they are also teaching for uh, high performance more broadly. And um, you know, one of the things that uh, we've tried to do is to create uh, tools for teachers to be able to develop lessons and, and, and assessments and so forth that, that would allow them to um, know how to uh, forward a curriculum and instruction and assessment uh, program for their students that actually enables uh, or, or makes plain the kind of outcomes in global competence uh, that they are seeking and as well to frame the actual instructional activities uh, in ways that are engaging, they're engaged around interesting global issues and problems, but are also directed towards um, ensuring that students are, are gaining the actual competencies, the global competencies that we think are important, that we've outlined in a set of you know, performance uh, outcomes within the very academic disciplines. And, and, and having the experience of being able to learn and show what they know at the same time through a kind of performance-based approach. And I think, importantly, the, the professional development we're trying to develop is, is a self-performance space. So we, we, want, we want teachers to experience the kind of, of learning and then, as we note in the book, the performances of understanding to actually do those kinds of uh, activities and, and engage in those kinds of, of, of learning uh, assessments themselves so they will know how, from experience, um, to develop those for their students. So there, there are ways that we're trying to move forward on and, and sort of thinking deeply about how you, um, in a way that doesn't trivialize um, global competence and, and how to teach global competence, but to help teachers really develop those knowledge and skills that will enable them to do that systematically for their students. So, uh, Veronica, is there something unique about American culture where we are not only sometimes reluctant to think about global issues, but we're maybe even suspicious of when these are introduced in schools? Hmm. Um. Yeah, so, so, so the interesting about as my my friend Marcelo Suarez Orozco tends to say, the interesting thing about exceptionalism is that is that it is such a common <laughs> such a common characteristic across countries. Every country is exceptional in its own uh, or considers itself exceptional in its own way. And I think that sort of in America, it's sort of geographic isolation or sort of historical construction of the national identity has uh, has really sort of made it um, not only uh, so that we don't. Uh, seem to have sort of um, as part of a public uh, um, discourse or public orientation sort of, the, sort of an, an, a keen interest uh, 
in in in, in what happens in in the world. You pick any young uh, kid in India, Argentina, uh, Italy, they will know much much more about what's happening in other, even in terms of youth culture, what's happening in in other countries than uh, than our than 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 our than our youth. You know, of course, I, I recognize that that's an enormous generalization, but for the most part, it's a pattern that that I think um, holds. The challenge is, you know, how to how to come to realize and um, and recognize um, the complexity of of this thing we call American culture um, uh, uh, and the, the 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 multitudes that 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 inhabit uh, this, uh, this 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 land, um, so that we can come to understand ourselves as enriched. By this diversity, um, in, in in deep, serious ways, not just you know, as 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 uh, not just because it sounds good, but really because we 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 believe it. We believe that there's um, value in uh, overlapping and coexisting and integrating sort of cultural perspectives um, as we have them uh, in America today, or as we have them in the world today. You know, France is a similar phenomenon. You know, we have. France is very mixed. Argentina is very mixed. Um, so it's a matter of recognizing uh, a game uh, who we are under a different framework. And that's tough. That's difficult to do. Tony, I'm interested in how Asia societies made a very significant commitment here. Um, and as you talk about the school program, I'm interested in how important you think this is. Um, and of course, I'm sort of handing you the the opportunity to to talk just about uh, sort of what the larger changes are in our world as a whole. How important global competency? Um, I I get that. I, I was asking if that was the question you were asking, but I, I will assume it is. I I think um, I mean for a variety of reasons we, we try to describe in the book. Um, Understand the world, understanding the world and how it works is actually, um, we think, a, an absolutely essential uh, uh, outcome for students from their education um, for a variety of reasons. I mean, certainly one that everybody can point to immediately is, is the nature of the economy having changed and, and becoming global in its orientation. Um, I mean, we know, for example, that you know, one in five jobs in the United States is in some way or other connected to international trade. And employers will say left and right that uh, if they had and you know, people in their employee who were more globally sophisticated, they would you know, profit that much more. Um, but it's even deeper than that. I mean, we have a kind of real change in distribution of labor in this, in, in this, in this world we live in, uh, where and, you know, employers are looking for people who can um, do the job uh, wherever they may find themselves in the world. Um, and so to be able to compete and to be uh, successful in, 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 the, in the work environment we live in now, you have to have the capacity this is the kind of things we talked about in our definition, to collaborate across cultural lines and to have the knowledge and skills and technology to be able to operate within a global environment. So participation in a global economy requires global competence, really, is the, is the bottom line there. Um, but equally important is the, the changes in the, in the kind of um, the, the demographic and the diversity, uh, the demographic makeup and the diversity within our, within our, country, within our country and within the, the world society. I mean, Everywhere in the world, um, immigration and migration are changing the, the fabric and the na nature of, of, of society. Um, but if you actually totaled up all the number of, of uh, immigrants across the world, it would be, a, if there was just one country, for example, it would be as large, or it would be the fourth largest country in the world um, behind um, China, India, and the United States. So what that means is that, that every community, um, um, from you know, Boston to, to, to Buenos Aires, is is much more diverse um, than it has been, and and the extent to which young people are able and 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 able to kind of uh, understand and, and deal with that diversity and not see it as a threat, but rather see it as an opportunity for cooperation and for exchange, that's going to make all the difference um, for them as individuals, but also our society in, in, in broader terms. So I think uh, uh, to be able to be competent in recognizing perspectives and communicating across ideas and working together with other people. Uh, becomes a, a backyard issue. Um, diversity is a new normal, and, and so young people have to have the capacity to not only kind of tolerate that, but really see it as an asset and, and move forward. 
But I think also, um, you know, we recently had this incredible storm in the east, uh, the Superstorm Sandy, Superstorm Sandy, and I think it, you know, it certainly brings the question to the table as to whether or not there is significant climate change going on, and and so you have in in the world, and so you have um, the, the fact that that in order to understand um, that as a global as an issue, whether or not our, our, our planet is warming, whether or not there's changes in the, in the, uh, in the, in the climate, um, these, are, these are not phenomena that are localized in any one country. They're, they're global phenomena. And so if we are going to have a sustainable planet, um, then people have to have the capacity to think in global terms. So uh, those, are, those are three reasons. I, I, think, I think one other reason that I think it's important that sometimes we don't talk about as much is it's kind of the, the, the learning value or the importance to to um, motivation and to engagement in school that a, a focus on global issues brings. You may well know that, that um, when students say why they drop out of high school, for example, it isn't because the, the, it's too hard or the bar isn't set too high, and certainly not because they think the teachers don't know their stuff, it's because they say it's boring. And we sometimes often say, well, you know, that's the two grand as it was when I was a young person. But the fact of the matter is engagement and motivation are hugely important. And what we found is that kind of situating learning within a global context provides a, a hugely relevant uh, instructional um, platform within which great instruction can occur. So a global focus adds a level of relevance to learning that I think is not trivial and really we think can make a difference in the outcome, either with, with regard to global competencies or, or you know, your common core state standards, as it were. So I think there's just a few reasons why we think global competencies, as I said, an essential principle to get global education going forward. Tony, how have the parents I, of the students I, reacted? Uh, oh, yeah, no, please go ahead, Veronica. Uh, I, I just wanted to sort of underline what, what Tony said because I think it's enormously important. So we we tend to think about it as sort of we as the fact that we have been uh, in uh, the United States so concerned with the achievement gap, which is a very important uh, um, a problem to to attend to, that we have. Uh, in a way, um, forgotten to pay attention to the relevance gap. You know, what is it that students uh, learn in the Phillips academies or in the sort of the, the elite schools uh, in our uh, in, uh, in 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 our country? And 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 what is it that that students get to learn in our public schools? You know, so how how can we make sure that the gap in terms of learning relevant uh, content is not increasing as we um, concern ourselves with uh, with uh, with the with the achievement gap, and I think that that's necessary. It's 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 essential for young people to uh, to succeed in the world in which or to have um, a respectable uh, and 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 and. and um, realized lives uh, in the world in which uh, uh, in which we live, and I think that it is also essential for our democracies. If you look at the debates um, around the elections uh, these days, and the and, and and the topics for deliberation on the table, sort of the debt is an international issue, migration an international issue, sustainability and climate change an international issue. Um, so preparing our youth, preparing our adults, preparing our elderly to have civic deliberations around these issues, it's not a know it all or know nothing, so to speak. It's really about deliberating together. It's really about coming to understand these issues that are uh, assailing our planet uh, together so that we can come up with uh, solutions uh, together. And I think that's sort of an investment in uh, our capacity to deliberate around these, uh, these issues is what, what, what Tony's after, what we are after, uh, and what, what, what I'm hoping um, uh, those participating in this conversation uh, will be after uh, as well, how to become a more informed, informed public and able to deliberate around these issues. Thank you, Veronica. Tony, uh, we're, we're going to go to Q&A now, but I wanted to give you a chance to to, to uh, pitch the specific activities that Asia Society is doing. And I actually made Honor a moderator as well, in case you want to turn some time over to her to talk about it. But obviously, you're doing some webinars coming up. We are. And Honor, if you can speak, I would more than happy to talk about this and this is your main project. Are you able to join us in this role? 
Go ahead. Yes. Hi. Oh. <laughs> so uh, this is our winter lineup. We're very excited to have a webinar for folks who are interested in teacher prep. And we've also been working to reschedule one um, on an important topic, project-based learning for uh, global education. So we actually have an archive. You can watch a recording of the first of those from last month. And then in January, we hope to have um, some amazing stories from one of our schools who's working on that. And then in January and February, we'll have some webinars from our Chinese language initiative. And in March, um, we'll be looking at our expanded learning uh, toolkit and the work that we do with after school programs and the like. So uh, thanks for that. And I hope to see lots of folks uh, join us for those, as well as our conferences, um, which we have annually, the National Chinese Language Conference in April, uh, co-sponsored by College Board. And then our Partnership for Global Learning Conference will be held uh, this summer here in New York. And um, all of that information is available on our website at asiasociety.org and then the education page. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Anna. And Veronica, I'm going to do the same thing here for you. Do you want to talk a little bit about um, Project Zero? Yes, definitely. So Project Zero, thank you for, for, for the chance to do so. Uh, so, so Project Zero is a, is a research institute um, and development institute within the Harvard Graduate School of Education, uh, for those of you who do, who do not uh, know what Project Zero is. Uh, and we have, um, we, we have a series of um, uh, global competence uh, relevant um, institutes coming up. Uh, one is, the most immediate one is in March on developing responsible, caring, and balanced youth. This is going to be led by Howard Gardner and Bill Damon, and it's very much um, uh, a, a question about the, uh, the state of mind uh, of our youth, issues of value, issues of uh, citizenship, uh, local, national, global, um, in, uh, in, and that's going to take place in Boston. We have our uh, signature institutes at the university of the Project Zero Classroom and the Future of Learning and there are a variety of uh, presentations, workshops, uh, and so forth that um, uh, that uh, attend to issues of uh, international uh, or global um, uh, global competence uh, education for the Future of Learning last year. Half of our uh, participants were from around the world, so it's a very sort of a very international uh, community uh, there, and we'll have a, an institute on thinking and learning in the 21st century that will be dealing with cultures, school cultures, and cultures of thinking and cultures of global competence in schools uh, in uh, London uh, in October. So, um, so I'd be delighted to see sort of any of you uh, there. Would be happy to continue the conversation face to face. Okay, so if you have a question for Veronica or Tony, you please put it in the chat or feel free to raise your hand. Uh, while we're doing so, I'm going to put up the, the slide for the Global Education Conference and put the link in the chat again, which starts next week and is free and is just a blast. While we're waiting, uh, Veronica, we didn't get to the uh, kind of worksheet type material you had in your slides. Would you like to describe that at all? Um, yes, I could do that. Or, you know, I, I was thinking that maybe one of the, I could do that. Yeah, why don't, why don't we show them? And I just will refer to what, you know, what, what those are. They're, they're coming out of the book uh, that Tony and I wrote. So if you project them. I just sort of mention what these are. So there's a chapter in the book that deals with the teaching for global competence. If you go back, Steve, to the previous um, to the previous um, slide, the one that's it. Um, so in this particular chapter, we pay attention to the kinds of questions that teachers have to ask. You know, what topics matter most to teach when one educates for global competence? Uh, what exactly is it that students will take away, sort of narrowing our goals? What exactly is it students will do to learn? And how will we assess for global competence? So that chapter sort of describes some principles that might 
uh, serve as guiding posts for teachers interested in designing projects or units that uh, are uh, focused um, on uh, global competence uh, work. Um, if you move us to the next slide. So that's sort of another example from the book. Um, Honor was great at identifying uh, several of these, um, and 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 again, it's a reminder uh, of Lossy who contributed in the design of this particular one, uh, and it's a reminder of um, of uh, of the kinds of things to pay uh, attention to as we are doing uh, designs. Uh, if you move to the next one. And the book also includes a collection of um, experiences. Um, I hesitate to call them activities. They would be thoughtful activities, activities to think with knowledge, if you wish. We call them uh, performances of global competence. Um, and we have identified a few that uh, seem to have been um, uh, successful or interest uh, of, of interest to, uh, to the teachers with whom uh, we have worked. So there's a collection of good ideas. Uh, in the uh, in the book um, itself. Steve, there's, there's, um, there's one question that uh, was raised, uh, I think, by Charlotte Buffing, um, that has to do with uh, what kind of global competence work is taking place in other countries. That I thought I might just quickly respond to. Um, it's very interesting. Um, uh, other countries are. And we, we mainly, as you might imagine, um, have a great deal of contact with, with countries in Asia. They are very much beginning to realize and to act on the notion that their young people need to be globally competent. Um, in Singapore, for example, it has actually been kind of written into their national goals that their students will have global awareness. And, and it, it makes perfect sense in a place like Singapore because um, it, is, it is by its nature a global place. I mean, as they say, there are no domestic flights in Singapore. Everything is, is global. And so they've made a concerted effort to begin to, um, in the way that Singaporeans approach education, to be systematic in thinking through, you know, as we have done, what are the characteristics of global competence that they want their students to, to engage in. It's also quite interesting that they also are quite um, uh, aware that their, 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 their teachers, their educators, need to become more globally competent. So before you become a principal, for example, in, in Singapore, you have to study abroad. Um, it, it's not a, a, a question. It, it is a requirement. And so they understand the need to have their, their, their educators begin to develop a broader worldview. And, and we just recently heard from uh, a colleague from Shanghai that there's now a new directive um, that we're literally having to translate from the Chinese to the English so we don't know exactly what it says. But it's really meant to describe um, what uh, what they want their young people to know and be able to do in terms of global competence and, and how teachers can approach that. So I think there's certainly um, in the Asian countries that we're, we're most familiar with a growing awareness that uh, global competence um, is really, very really important. And, and they have a real clear understanding that the future is a shared future between uh, countries in the world and, and they want their young people to be ready for that. Thank you so much, Veronica and Tony. I'm clapping for you. To do so, I'm hovering over the smiley face icon, and then I go down to applause. Really delightful to have you both here. The book is Educating for Global Competence, Preparing Our Youth to Engage the World. It is free to download. You can either go to my blog post, or I'm sure Anna will put the link again in the chat. Really delightful to have you both here. Thanks so much for being here. Great. Uh, thanks for having us. It's great to, to be in this conversation. Um, With both of you. Does would you like me to react to some of Go the ahead, Veronica. Oh. oh, no, no, no. Go courtesy ahead. Courtesy to people I, I, we typically. No, no. As a courtesy, we typically finish on time. So <laughs> if you'd like to react, let's have you do so. But if, if those of you who need to leave, please feel free to leave. But if you saw something in the chat, Veronica, that I missed, please go ahead and address it. Oh, no, simply to um, underscore the danger of a single story by uh, Chimamanda Adichie. Uh, some folks have seen this video. It's a TED Talk. Uh, highly recommended. Absolutely beautiful work. Terrific. 
Okay, thank you both. That was really delightful. Really appreciate it. Don't miss the Global Education Conference next week. GlobalEducationConference.com. Take care, everybody. Have a great night or day, depending on where you are. Bye now. Thank you, Steve. Bye-bye.